Macular degeneration is a leading cause of vision loss, with 15% of Americans being at risk or already affected. Scientific evidence proves that by using mesozeaxanthin, lutein, and zeaxanthin together replenishes the macular pigment and promotes healthier vision. This formula comes in only one product, MacuHealth. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gell, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. Please visit the film's website at Open Your Eyes 2020, featuring interviews with more than 50 optometrists from around the country, sharing information on eye care and eye disease. Glaucoma is the leading cause of irreversible blindness in the US and worldwide. It is estimated that 6 million Americans are living with glaucoma, half of which don't know they have it. Glaucoma typically has no symptoms and is often thought to be caused from elevated eye pressure, but up to 40% of those who develop glaucoma have eye pressure in the normal range. Today's guest, ophthalmologist, glaucoma specialist, Dr. Jeffrey Goldberg, MD, PhD, is the chair of ophthalmology at the Byers Eye Institute at Stanford University. Dr. Goldberg is focused on finding a cure for this blinding disease. His research includes neuroprotection and regeneration of the optic nerve. He is also working on developing novel stem cell and nanotherapeutic treatments. Welcome, Dr. Goldberg, and thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for my, very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate it. So let's get into it. What is glaucoma, and do we really even know what glaucoma is? Yeah, boy, that's a good question just to start us off with. And, you know, I can talk about there's a lot of things that we know about glaucoma, but I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to jump to the punchline here. The truth is, is in most most cases, we don't really know, you know, what's causing it, what the underlying issue. But, but let me tell you a number of things that we do know about glaucoma. We know um, that glaucoma has two major risk factors and a number of minor risk factors. Uh, the major risk factors are high eye pressure and increasing age, and we'll talk about each of those a little bit more, I think, later. Um, but that doesn't define the disease, and it's important that we, when we think about defining the disease that we stick very carefully to what we know. We define glaucoma as a characteristic degeneration of the optic nerve. And that degeneration has some standard sort of usual features associated with it. But that's really as close as we get. Uh, we really don't have a better, a much better definition for glaucoma or an understanding of, you know, in most cases, what causes it. Um, go ahead. I mean, why do people still go blind from glaucoma? Well, uh, yeah, that's a, that's another that's another heavy question, and uh, you know, there's there's a couple of spots where we're really missing it in glaucoma. One is the initial diagnosis. Now, glaucoma affects people's, in most cases, affects people's peripheral vision first. And, and only very late in the disease does it uh, pinch in and end up cutting off the center of your vision and, and making you go all you know, fully blind that way. And uh, because it affects your peripheral vision first, most people don't notice if they have a problem. You know, if your peripheral vision is good enough such that when you're driving, you notice a pedestrian come off the sidewalk, you think you're doing fine, but your peripheral vision might be quite significantly down even at that stage. Uh, and because people don't notice it, you know, that's why glaucoma was often called the sneak thief of sight. So, so we're not diagnosing it very well. In fact, in community surveys that have been done both in the United States and around the world, uh, where they just take everyone walking down the street one day and test them for different eye diseases, they'll find that, you know, the prevalence of glaucoma might be, you know, between one or 2% of people over a certain age. Um, but half of the people that they find didn't know that they already had glaucoma. And so, you know, that means that, that and that's in the developed world. Now, now we also have a problem both in the developed world and the developing world uh, in managing glaucoma. And even with all the treatments that we have, uh, there's still a fraction of people who continue to progress, get worse, and eventually go blind. And obviously, that's even more of a problem in the developing world than it is in um, 
countries like ours, but, but it's a problem in countries like ours too. It really is access to care and our ability to diagnose progression of the disease and treat it adequately. Why do 50% of the people who have glaucoma don't even know that they have it? And what can yeah. they do to, to find out? Yeah, that's an important question. And getting screened for eye disease is really critical, especially, of course, if you're symptomatic. And, you know, we've got a significant fraction of the country who wears glasses for one reason or another. And so they're going into uh, their optometrist or ophthalmologist, their eye care provider. And uh, as part of that appointment, in addition to measuring them for the glasses they may need, uh, hopefully they're all undergoing a, a very standard screening exam, which can include not just checking the eye pressure, which is quick and easy, but as I mentioned, not everyone who has glaucoma has a high pressure to start with. Uh, so also getting their optic nerve examined, both, both looking at the optic nerve and also doing a functional test. So, so getting that kind of screening, and, and if you're not someone who's going in for glasses uh, otherwise, um, then uh, making a point, um, you know, especially as you get older, um, to get a screening exam uh, and, and repeat that every few years, even if you have no other issues, I think that's very good advice. And, and that would really help us catch quite a number of the people who, who are walking around out there not realizing that they have glaucoma. The public is getting mixed messages because people that sell contact lenses online sometimes we'll say, well, you, know, you don't want to go and get that pesty uh, puff of air in your eye, you know, just kind of buy your contact lenses from, from us. And, and you don't need to really bother with that. So what kind of message should the public be getting about preventing blindness from glaucoma? Yeah, you know, you bring up a really important point. And obviously there's a huge move in our world towards, you know, online delivery of everything, including, you know, our healthcare services now. Um, but unfortunately for eye disease, there's really not a good enough substitute for seeing a live eye care provider and having them examine and look inside the eye. We don't have a substitute for that yet. And so, so even if you're getting your glasses or your contact lenses uh, uh, filled with an online service, um, it's not really a substitute for going in periodically and getting a full proper eye exam. So I'd really encourage people to, 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 to at least get that full eye exam, even if, they're, even if they're buying their glasses or contacts online normally. For, for measuring intraocular pressure, the pressure in, in your eye, what other techniques are, are used besides measuring the pressure to determine if somebody may have glaucoma? Yeah, so we, we do want to check the pressure. It's a helpful screening uh, tool right there. But besides checking pressure, there's really two other things that need to get done. And these two other things refer to what I mentioned as the definition of glaucoma, which is the characteristic degeneration. And what's characteristic about it? two things. Number one, there's characteristic changes in the optic nerve head. The optic nerve is what connects the eye to the brain. It carries all the visual information from the eye to the brain. And uh, so obviously that's an important highway to keep running smoothly. Um, and, uh, and we can see the head, the tip of the optic nerve, when we examine a patient uh, by looking into their eye whether we've dilated them or not, it's easier to see if we've dilated the patient, but we can, we can examine by looking in the front of the eye and see the optic nerve head. And in glaucoma, the optic nerve head has a series of very typical changes associated with it that, that your eye care provider can see. Uh, these include what we call cupping or a loss of the tissue around the rim. There's a certain kind of atrophy of the pigmented cells that, that's around the optic nerve that can happen. Um, little focal notches. Sometimes we'll see a little dot of blood in the optic nerve head, and that's also a, a very strong clue that the patient might have uh, glaucoma at that stage. Um, so those are what we call structural changes. We can also measure the structural changes with advanced imaging. We can take a picture of the inside of the eye, which is a great idea because then your eye care provider can look at your eye the next year or a few years later and compare it to the original picture that your eye care provider took the first time. 
and see if there's been any change over time. It's that change over time that cues us in that something may be degenerating that you might have glaucoma. We also have other advanced imaging. There's a technology called optical coherence tomography. It uses an infrared laser, not a laser that burns anything. It's just reflected light from inside the eye. And that laser scan of the retina uh, can tell us the thickness of the nerve fibers going into the optic nerve head. And, uh, and we can measure that again over time, you know, repeating that test every year or, or, or a few years in an asymptomatic non-glaucoma patient just as a screening tool can be very helpful. Um, so those are the characteristic changes that we would definitely want to be looking for at your eye care providers to check the structure. And then the function, there's a very characteristic functional decline in glaucoma patients, which I mentioned before usually starts with your peripheral vision where you don't even notice it. And we have a few different tests that can be done in the office that basically show different lights or patterns of lights to the peripheral nerve. Uh, to the peripheral vision, and then that tests uh, whether you're seeing kind of, you know, at the normal level for your age group, um, it gets tested against a normalized, you know, database of people your age, and, uh, and that can spit out also a result as to whether you are showing any peripheral vision defects that would be consistent with mild or, or moderate or severe glaucoma. And uh, so getting that group of screening activities done, um, especially as you're aging, even if you have no other issues or normally only go in for glasses or contacts, is a very, very smart idea. There's an advancement in OCT called OCT angiography that may be able to show us some new early patterns of glaucoma. Can you go into that just a bit? Yeah, absolutely. You know, for many years we've been uh, studying the OCT picture right around the optic nerve head to measure those fibers. But there have been a number of advances and you brought up an important one. One advance also is to take an OCT of the center of the retina where the center of your vision is. That's called the macula. And that macular OCT can also show us the thickness of the retinal ganglion cell layer. Those are the neurons in the retina that degenerate in glaucoma. And so if that layer is also getting thinner than normal for your age, that's also a signal that, that you may have glaucoma. So it's good to check that one too. And then there's a really cool new advance in uh, OCT called OCT angiography or OCTA. OCTA um, has been studied quite a bit over the last few years. What it does is it actually uses a trick of the reflected infrared light and analysis of that light where it can pick out the moving blood cells in your blood vessels in the retina compared to the not moving cells of the rest of your retinal tissue. And that signal actually allows it to create a map of all the blood vessels where you have blood flowing. And so uh, this is really a great non-invasive way to check all the blood vessels. Now, what we've found in both early and more severe glaucoma patients is that those blood vessels are in decline uh, in the retina. There are fewer blood vessels, especially the smallest ones, with blood flowing through them uh, as you get glaucoma and the glaucoma advances. And we actually don't know exactly sort of the chicken and the egg of that. Um, are you getting glaucoma because there's less blood flow? Or is there less blood flow because you have glaucoma and when you have glaucoma, you just, you know, your neurons in your eye aren't that active, aren't as active. And so they just don't need as much blood flow. And so it is a bit of a chicken and egg, but, but it is showing some utility in screening. Um, if I had to say, I'd probably say, you know, if you're going to um, uh, watch your budget and keep things tight, probably doing just the OCTs, um, probably are gonna catch enough of it. It does look like OCT looks pretty similar to OCTA in terms of being able to detect disease early. Obviously, we're gonna miss a couple of people in the earliest stages of disease with either technology without the other. But again, if you're repeating your testing on a regular basis, you know, every couple of years at least, um, then the chance that you're gonna get missed with either of those technologies is probably pretty small. Now there's new technology that's coming out that could measure your pupils very sense, very, very, in a very sensitive way. 
Can you talk a little bit about how the pupils are related? The pupils. Yeah, are absolutely. That's another, I think, uh, uh, useful screening tool. It's it's probably used less commonly, but it's definitely one of the available screening tools. The way your pupil works is that when you're in bright light, of course, your pupil gets smaller uh, to let less light in. And uh, then, of course, when you're in very dim light, your pupils dilate and get bigger to let more light in. And the way that works, that's actually a reflex. And the way it works is that light goes into your eye and that light signal goes down the optic nerve back to some of the early centers in the brain, which then detect that light and they send a signal back down the nerves that go to the iris uh, and control the pupil to open and close it. So if you have degeneration in your retina or in your optic nerve, um, then uh, the light signal going down your optic nerve is going to be less, and therefore your pupil reaction to the light will be less. And we now have very sensitive ways of measuring the pupil diameter and the pupil response to light. Uh, and so we know that that can be a reflection of your optic nerve. And you know, for example, whether you have glaucoma, it's not specific to glaucoma. It will also pick up other optic nerve diseases fairly readily as well. Um, so that's another opportunity to do some screening and uh, get another test or, or some confidence as to whether you may have optic nerve diseases, including glaucoma. What other optic nerve diseases could it find? Or you know, the screening tests being Yeah, so we, we group all of these into um, a group of diseases that we call optic neuropathies. These are all degenerations of the optic nerve. Glaucoma uh, is the number one cause of irreversible blindness in the world and is also by far the most common optic neuropathy. But there are, as you point out, other optic neuropathies. Uh, for example, uh, you can get optic neuritis, which is kind of like a version of multiple sclerosis that affects, preferentially affects, or at least starts with the optic nerve um, uh, demyelinating. Uh, it loses the sort of insulation around the fibers in the optic nerve, uh, and you lose vision that way. You can get optic nerve strokes, uh, which are, of course, similar to getting strokes in the brain. Um, and those also cause an optic neuropathy. You can get something called traumatic optic neuropathy. Sometimes, you know, thankfully in rare cases, if you're in a very bad car accident, for example, or something with head trauma, the uh, blunt uh, uh, force uh, sort of shakes the optic nerve in a certain way that, um, that can lead to degeneration of those fibers. Um, so that's thankfully le very, le very much less common in people, traumatic optic neuropathy. And then there are other ones. There are some inherited, rare inherited optic neuropathies. And, um, you, you know, if you're very severely um, vitamin deficient, you can get an optic neuropathy. There are a couple of medications that can very rarely lead to an optic neuropathy. And if you're on those, you'll, you, 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 your doctor will have already told you, you might, you might even already be getting screening exams to check your optic nerve and your retina regularly. Um, yeah. There are many different theories on the cause of glaucoma. What causes it? Do you have a bias to, you know, being one of the top glaucoma specialists in the world? you have a bias in what you think it, the cause is? Yeah, well, let me, let me give you a couple of answers to that. Uh, you know, it, it brings up, as we discussed earlier, a couple of important questions. So first of all, glaucoma is mostly in older adults, but there are some infantile and pediatric uh, uh, juvenile forms of glaucoma. Thankfully, those are even more rare, uh, but they're very severe when they do occur. It's obviously very sad uh, uh, because these kids are in for a lifetime of challenge to try to get that glaucoma under control. Uh, we do have specialists, of course, that specialize just even in that pediatric and infantile glaucoma. In those ones, um, as a field, we've actually discovered a few of the genes that cause uh, those infantile or pediatric uh, juvenile glaucomas. Um, and that's exciting because when we know a single gene, there's some hope that we'll dissect out, you know, either how to correct the gene or correct what the gene is doing bad for the eye and the optic nerve. 
And, um, and uh, so, so in a few cases, in a few cases, especially those, we know what causes it. Then there's a group of other hypotheses or data that's come from animal studies of glaucoma. It turns out that there's a number of animals, not just that you would give glaucoma, there's a number of animals that naturally develop glaucoma. And so we're learning a lot, both from people and animals. So some of those include things like decreased blood flow to the optic nerve head. We just discussed that a moment ago in the context of OCT and geography. Uh, also, there's decreased transport of nutrients and proteins up and down the optic nerve. It's thought that maybe the uh, 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 eye pressure in the disease kind of clamps off the fibers going down the optic nerve and prevents them from transporting all the important proteins up and down that highway. And, uh, and so that may be contributing. Uh, there's been a lot of attention in recent years to mitochondria in the retinal ganglion cells and their fibers in the optic nerve. Mitochondria are the sort of little energy centers, little energy powerhouses of all of our cells. And we know that when the pressure raises even just a little bit too high, uh, the mitochondria actually stop moving up and down the axons and they also get fragmented. They, they break apart into tiny little pieces and become less functional that way. And so if, you, and then of course your cells are missing out on the, all of that and all the energy that they're supposed to be providing and other functions that the mitochondria provide. Uh, so these are all really good uh, uh, hypotheses. All of them have good data. There's other, there's other very strong data around some of the support cells in the optic nerve. There's support cells next to the neurons called astrocytes that are almost certainly contributing to the death of the cells in glaucoma. The retinal ganglion cells within the retina, they have to collect all that information, all that light information from the other cells in the retina before they send it down the optic nerve. And uh, they collect it in these tiny little fibers that are called dendrites. And we know that the dendrites are also degenerating early in the disease. So maybe they're not getting the right levels of activity or visual stimulation to help keep them alive. There's really good data for all of these. And now I'm going to finish by skirting your question and, and actually saying that, you know, we're not going to really know in human disease which of these is, you know, the cause. And, and by the way, there might be multiple causes and it might be different in different people. You know, glaucoma might be a collection of different diseases with different causes that in the end look the same and we call them all glaucoma. But we're not going to really know the answer to your question until we test a new therapy that's directed at something like blood flow or axon transport or mitochondrial stability or dendrite retraction. And when we test a drug that works on one of those and we find that it works in glaucoma, that's going to be the aha moment where we say, look, we finally know one of the features that's causing the, the, the visual dysfunction in glaucoma. Um, because we finally have a drug that really treats the disease that way. I know people are going to want to know, what animal naturally gets glaucoma? Oh, there's a couple of dogs uh, that can get glaucoma. Uh, actually, dogs can get it quite commonly, uh, but there are a couple of species uh, that, that, that I think can get it more, more commonly. I think beagles might be one of them. Um, there's a couple of researchers around the country who study some of these dog families that, that get glaucoma. Um, so if you have a pet dog, you can get your dog to get its eye check too. So before we, when we mentioned OCP and loss of nerve fiber layer or ganglion cell death, it's a similar pattern that we see in Alzheimer's disease. Sometimes people say glaucoma is actually Alzheimer's disease of the eye. How is it related? Yeah, there's two important observations that, that cause, uh, that, that support that hypothesis and, and that saying that, that you point out. Uh, <clears throat> one is that the nerve fiber layers of the optic nerve degenerate in Alzheimer's in a way similar to, to how they degenerate in glaucoma. Not nearly as severely, thankfully, but we can detect some of the same changes. Um, so that's, that's one sort of core observation. In fact, it's quite interesting because it's, it's really being studied quite extensively now whether those same OCT pictures or maybe the next generation of them that might be even more sensitive, 
whether those pictures might be a way to diagnose Alzheimer's or follow track people's Alzheimer's disease and how are they doing on their Alzheimer's treatments, et cetera, maybe even used in clinical trials to test new Alzheimer's drugs. So kind of a very exciting area around eye imaging for Alzheimer's disease and an area that the Alzheimer's community should really support more fully because, because of all the promise in that direction. But coming back to glaucoma, there's a second reason that those two have been linked up. There are uh, little plaques uh, that accumulate in the brains of Alzheimer's patients that have a protein or a protein fragment in them called uh, A-beta. And it turns out that in glaucoma, in the, in the retina, next to the retinal ganglion cells that are degenerating in glaucoma, that little uh, concretions or plaques of that A-beta also appear in, in the retina. And uh, there's some data to suggest that, gosh, if we could, if we could um, remove those plaques or, plaques or even better block those plaques from forming, uh, that we could help preserve the retinal ganglion cells function in the retina and, uh, and also prevent the degeneration in the retina. And, and that's an area of active investigation uh, uh, I think there are some promising drug candidates that can block or reverse the A-beta accumulation. Um, and getting those tested in glaucoma patients, I think, is an important priority for our field. Again, to really determine, ultimately, whether that's a, an important opportunity to, to slow or prevent disease. Vision Edge gives you less eye strain and reduced damage caused by blue light. We like to call Vision Edge sunscreen for the eye. It all starts with your highest level of visual performance, only achievable through scientifically proven vision edge. How far are we away from patients going to the eye doctor to see if they have early Alzheimer's through our imaging? Techniques? Yeah, the, the issue right now is that the standard OCTs that we have um, available to us, you know, in all of our provider offices, those OCTs, uh, they can detect the very small changes in Alzheimer's disease like they do in others, but those changes aren't big enough to say with confidence that the patient uh, might have Alzheimer's and sort of send them in to their neurologist, let's just say, uh, send them back for that. So we're not, we're not quite there yet. Um, there are newer technologies using, for example, visible light OCT, and adaptive optics uh, versions of OCT that look like they might be much more sensitive to structural and also metabolic changes in the retina. And then those could be more reliably sensitive for Alzheimer's, you know, have a better predictive value for Alzheimer's and, and, and other brain diseases, by the way, not just Alzheimer's, but uh, Parkinson's disease and uh, and, uh, and some of these other, you know, significant um, diseases of our central nervous system. The current OCTs, the resolution is about 10 to 15 microns. With adaptive optics, what's the resolution of that? Well, we're now seeing structures that are uh, subcellular and down to the one micron level. Our, our best commercial OCTs give us resolutions in, in one direction of around 10 plus microns and in the other direction uh, uh, resolutions, you know, down to three to five microns even. And so, so we're getting good at detecting change, for example, in the thickness of the nerve fiber layers in the retina using OCT. Uh, but these next generation technologies that we and others are working on and, and, and imaging patients with now as part of our research studies, uh, they're exciting because of the resolution. I mean, we're now uh, able to see, um, you know, mitochondria and mitochondrial function and other, other subcellular structures that are being transported up and down the axons of the retinal ganglion cells in the retina. It's it, it's very exciting, and, uh, and, and really, we're now at the stage of saying, okay, we can see this stuff, and what does it mean? It, for mitochondrial disease, is there anything that you could recommend or that you recommend now to improve mitochondrial function in a person? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, we haven't found in general or for glaucoma patients a, a sort of a, a, a proven way to, to help with that or to sort of give your mitochondria a boost. Um, there are supplements that you can get at your 
local store that claim to do that, but they haven't been studied properly in clinical trials and certainly not for glaucoma protection, for example. That said, I recommend to all of my patients that the things that are good for your blood thro flow throughout the rest of the body are really good for your blood flow to the optic nerve uh, where your glaucoma might be happening. And, um, and so I recommend healthy eating, lots of vegetables. And I also recommend that just to hedge your bet, take a one-a-day vitamin that has all of the regular B-complex vitamins in it. Um, and uh, so that's what I recommend. And, and then combining healthy eating with regular exercise. And the, the, the most important threshold for exercise is actually to go from zero to some exercise. So even if it's just, I tell my patients, even if it's just a 20, 30 minute brisk walk around the block, uh, uh, three to five times a week, you know, it doesn't have to be every day. It doesn't have to be long. You don't have to be sweating. You should be breathing heavy. Uh, that says that you're kind of activating your cardiovascular system and, and exercising your, your heart and lungs. Um, but but that, that's, that's the most important is to go from none to some. After that, you know, the more you do, you, you, you do get increasing returns, but, but most important is just get some exercise. So healthy eating, some exercise. Obviously, in today's world, staying away from smoking um, is, is, is fairly critical. The uh, data uh, always waxes, waxes back and forth on, uh, you know, whether a little bit of alcohol is good for your blood flow or irrelevant to your blood flow. Uh, I usually just stay silent on that one. <laughs> Since we talked about systemic disease associated with glaucoma, let's talk about sleep apnea and migraine. How are they related? Yeah, that's, those are good questions. So in both of those diseases, albeit for different reasons, you actually are at risk of reducing blood flow to your retina and optic nerve. Migraine actually happens because the the blood vessels, some of our blood vessels actually have nerves around the blood vessels. And those nerves can cause the blood vessels to open and close, of course. And sometimes in patients who get migraines, the blood vessels will actually spasm closed and, and decrease blood flow, you know, temporarily, of course, uh, not to the level of having a stroke, for example, but they'll decrease blood flow temporarily to wherever that blood vessel is going. And so some of the blood vessels that, um, you know, are around the, you know, the brain in different areas, when they spasm, you'll get the typical headache of migraine. Uh, but a lot of people who get migraines actually get a, a little visual aura before the migraine. They might see some sparkling lights around the edge or their vision might grow a little dim in one eye, for example, uh, uh, you know, slightly before the headache starts on. And those are obviously very helpful signs because then they can potentially take medicine and block the migraine from happening more fully. Um, but it reflects blood vessels going to the retina spasming close. And the reason your vision gets dim is that for a moment, your retina is actually getting less less oxygen, less blood flow. Um, and uh, so we talked already about the fact that glaucoma might be a problem, at least in part, of reduced blood flow to the optic nerve uh, and parts of the retina. And uh, so migraine might be exacerbating that, at least in some patients. And that's why migraine is an associated risk factor for glaucoma. Very similar kind of story in sleep apnea. In sleep apnea, uh, patients usually have a breathing pathway issue that causes them to uh, stop breathing uh, for you know a few you know a few more seconds or a half minute while they're sleeping at night. You can also have a central sleep apnea where the uh, nerves that are controlling your breathing are actually responsible for you having periods of apnea, which are periods where you're again where you're not breathing at night. And during those periods where you're not breathing, even if it's just for you know, 30 seconds, your blood oxygen obviously goes, you know, dips down quite a bit. And, uh, and that's to your whole body, but your nerve might be, especially if you have glaucoma, your nerve might be very sensitive to those dips in oxygen. And so we do ask patients who have uh, glaucoma whether they also have migraine and also whether they also have sleep apnea. Sometimes if we have kind of a mystery patient, we'll actually send them for a sleep study and they'll turn out to have sleep apnea and we'll focus on getting both their sleep apnea treated as well as their glaucoma treated. There are certain people that have migraines that don't get the headache, they just get the aura. Why is that? 
Yeah, it just it's really dependent on which blood vessels uh, happen to spasm. And if you get the eye and the brain ones spasming, you'll get the aura and the headache. If you have only the brain ones but not the eye vessels spasming, uh, you might get the headache without aura. And some people have ocular migraine, we call it, where just the blood vessels going to the retina uh, or optic nerve spasm, and they'll their vision will dim out for some period of time. Uh, but not, uh, but then not not get the headache at all. And, and there are many migraine patients whose migraines are a bit different every time, and sometimes they'll have a little more or less of, of each feature. And how is metabolic syndrome related to glaucoma or a little bit elevated intraocular pressure? Yeah, so metabolic syndrome, we usually use that to refer to the kind of cluster of issues that involve like obesity, diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes, um, and, uh, and a lot of the cardiovascular effects that come with that. And those cardiovascular effects, uh, including those from diabetes, again, can reduce blood flow to the retina and optic nerve. Uh, and, um, you know, it's interesting, in, in early studies, there was a suggestion that mild diabetes, I mean, controlled, not out of control diabetes, but mild diabetes might actually be slightly protective against glaucoma. Later studies were not able to replicate that, that finding. So, you know, it's not a clear signal on that, on that answer. But either way, we do know that, that the uh, cardiovascular effects of metabolic syndrome um, are, are not good for the blood flow to the optic nerve and, 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 and are not good for the retina or generally, of course. Um, and then you, you also brought up about the eye pressure. And in some studies, it's been suggested that if you have metabolic syndrome, particularly if you have some of the cardiovascular effects around high, high blood pressure, um, that you um, may have higher eye pressure. It turns out that the blood pressure and the eye pressure are uh, only very slightly related. The eye pressure is actually controlled by fluid production and drainage inside the eye. When the fluid does drain out of the eye, it does have to drain eventually into blood vessels. And so the sort of a pressure on the back end of the system is influenced by our, by our blood pressure. I think it's more of an effect though at the retina and optic nerve. You know, if the eye pressure is higher uh, then your uh, blood pressure, uh, you'll reduce blood flow, obviously, into the nerve. Uh, and even if those are just slightly imbalanced, it will change the what we call ocular perfusion pressure, or how much blood and oxygen are getting into the eye um, because of the eye pressure. So, so we do like to uh, look out for that. It's it's not. It, 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 you know, we, we probably should do better in as eye care providers checking patients' blood pressures, but we've kind of relegated that to their primary care doctor or other doctor. And so it's, it's not common to get your blood pressure checked at your eye care provider's office, uh, even though we do want patients to be looking out for their blood pressure and other, and other concomitant diseases. What do you think is more important and, and relates more to ocular perfusion pressure? systolic or diastolic pressure or about the same? It's really both, yeah. And the formula for calculating an ocular perfusion pressure uh, it includes both of those uh, features. And, and I'll say just again more generally, the uh, data has gone back and forth. It used to be that we paid a lot of attention to systolic, the high number of your blood pressure. Uh, but I know in recent years or even decades that the cardiovascular community has also put a lot more attention to the, onto the diastolic, the lower number of your blood pressure. In the end, for the calculation, we do use both of those numbers, and, and, and controlling both are, are almost certainly important for your general cardiovascular health. I want to go back to signs and symptoms of glaucoma. I mean, typically there aren't, with open angle glaucoma, many, at least at the beginning, many uh, symptoms. But when there are symptoms of open angle glaucoma, what would they be? And then I talk a little bit about narrow glaucoma where people can get headaches or little aches around their eye. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, so that, that, that comes back to what we had just broached, which was the, the eye makes fluid on the inside. That fluid obviously feeds some of the inside structures. It's, it's an aqueous or a watery fluid. And then that, that fluid drains out of the eye in a little ring 
The ring is called the trabecular meshwork, uh, primarily, and uh, that is right behind, right in front of the iris, which, you know, in me is a brown circle, but some people have blue or green eyes. Uh, and right at the very edge, front edge of the iris, underneath the cornea, which is the clear window on the front of the eye, um, is, is what we call the angle. We call it the angle because it's the angle, well, let's hold it this way, it's the angle between the cornea and the iris. And right in there is the drain for that fluid inside the eye. And normally uh, we have open angles and there's plenty of room for that fluid to get through and drain out of the eye normally and therefore keep a normal pressure. But some people, because of their anatomy, um, uh, or, and it's also more common in certain ethnicities, uh, it can run in families, and it can also decrease with age, the angles can be narrower. And if they're too narrow, at some point they can actually pinch off or close. And so we call that narrow angles and narrow angle glaucoma, or even if it fully closes, angle closure, closure glaucoma. Now, to be honest, most people won't notice anything, even if they have narrow angles, or even if they have a, like a chronic narrow angle glaucoma, because we can't feel our eye pressure. Uh, it, it's very unusual for patients to be able to feel it. And most of the time when patients feel a little ache around the eyes or a little headache around the eyes, most of the time it's from other causes that have nothing to do with glaucoma. If they come in for a checkup, we might incidentally find they have glaucoma, but usually those aches were not from glaucoma. Now that's different in angle closure. If your angle fully closes, your pressure will actually go up very high, very quickly, and you'll feel that. You'll have eye pain. Your eye will also be red and tearing, and it will not be subtle. It'll be hurting so much, you'll feel nauseous, you'll, you'll feel like, gosh, I've got to go immediately to the eye doctor or the emergency room, and, those, and that is what you have to do. Um, so it's not subtle. Uh, it's not, um, you know, people can have a little bit of red eye, a little bit of tearing, a little bit of ache, kind of each on their own, uh, and that doesn't mean that you have angle closure or even narrow angles. Uh, but if you have all three of those in a very severe way, all at once, tearing, redness, and, uh, and pain, uh, then that could be angle closure. We have very good treatments for angle closure. If we see that you have narrow angles, we can actually do a laser procedure that will prevent you from getting angle closure uh, in the future. Uh, it's kind of like, I would say, it's kind of like wearing a seatbelt in the car. Just get the laser procedure. It's like wearing a seatbelt. Your risk of getting in a car accident is small. But if you get in a car accident, it could be catastrophic. Your risk of getting angle closure is small. Uh, but if you have narrow angles, you could get angle closure. And so um, getting that laser is a low risk procedure that's kind of like wearing the seatbelt. It prevents the catastrophic vision loss that can come with an acute angle closure event. Uh, other than that, occasionally patients will notice that their peripheral vision just doesn't seem as good. Um, if they have trouble uh, with the lower portions of their visual field from glaucoma, they might have difficulty, for example, on the stairs or with curbs. Uh, and so, you know, it becomes like a fall risk. And so, uh, obviously, if someone's uh, having issues with the stairs or their vision or curbs, um, that would be a reason for them, without knowing anything about glaucoma, to say, geez, I better go see the eye doctor. And and go into their eye pro care provider and get a full exam, including some of the testing we talked about earlier in the hour. Now, if someone has glaucoma, can they drive? And how do we determine whether they can or they can't? Yeah, you know, the states have different rules about what constitutes legal blindness when it comes to driving. If your central vision is still preserved, um, then uh, most states will still let you drive. I think it's 2040 or better in California. Um, I'm not sure about New Jersey, obviously. Yeah. Okay, there you go. And, uh, and then you also have to have, um, in each state, some number of degrees of peripheral vision. In other words, you can't be down to just the tiniest little holes of the center of your vision and all of your peripheral vision is gone. Uh, and again, that kind of testing gets done using one of these visual field machines that we talked about earlier. And, uh, and so if you're having trouble, for example, on the eye chart at the DMV renewing your license, uh, they'll send you to an eye care provider to do these full checkups and to 
uh, sign a form that says, look, you do have good enough vision that meets that state's criteria, or, or if you don't, you don't. Um, and so, yeah, so the, so the peripheral vision loss from glaucoma can lead to, um, you know, legal blindness, inability to drive, and sort of the associated disability with that. How about reading? Is it when it, when it starts affecting patients' reading vision, how can we help them? Yeah, you know, that's really good. And um, one of the very common symptoms of glaucoma, uh, um, like you were asking before, especially later into the disease, is a dimness to your vision and also like a color washout, um, especially if your eyes have asymmetric glaucoma, if one eye is worse than the other, you know, patients will notice like, geez, the reds don't look as red in this eye as they do in this eye. Um, and so, uh, you know, encouraging use of brighter lighting around the home to prevent falls and also to facilitate reading, using much brighter lighting is very helpful for patients with glaucoma and with other eye diseases. Uh, and, and also very important because of the fall risk to make sure that you've got really good bright lighting around the home. Um, you know, some patients are really aided obviously by magnifiers or stronger reading glasses too. Um, uh, and uh, and um, uh, let's see, I had another thought about that. You were asking about a reading like reverse polarity. Uh, oh yes, I, I, I wanted to say about reading also. Yeah, so so there are also some some tools that they can that people can use that sort of, um, for example, if you read white letters on a background, and there are both computer programs and and uh, iPhone or tablet type programs, uh, as well as just home uh, boxes you can put on your desk that can do those kinds of uh, contrast enhancing. Uh, uh, contrast enhancements to your book, let's say, if you're reading a book. Um, and, uh, and I want to point out that reading's a particularly good one. Uh, we have uh, uh, faculty here at the Eye Institute who are actually studying reading, and there are others around the country. And it turns out that even in the earlier stages of glaucoma, before your vision is very deeply affected, you know, on the uh, uh, peripheral vision test even, it turns out that uh, it's already affecting your reading, and uh, we can measure that using things like reading speed, and we have ways in the office of checking it by using eye tracking machines and, and watching people read and seeing where their eyes go and how fast they move from word to word. Um, and so we know that's an issue, and, uh, and so I would say counseling our patients early in the disease, even if they're not deeply affected yet by glaucoma, counseling them on some of these tricks for home lighting, reading lighting, etc. cetera. Um, it's, it's never too early to start you know, counseling people. Now, who's at risk? We talked about risk factors a little bit. We wanted to get back to that. Tell us about who's really at risk for it. Yeah, so uh, we know that family history, for example, is a risk factor. Um, uh, it, it might increase your risk from something like 1% or 2% to something like 15 or 20% if you have a primary relative, a, a parent or a sibling, for example, with, uh, with glaucoma. So that's definitely an increased risk factor. Just because your parent has it doesn't mean you're guaranteed to get it, uh, of course, um, but, but it does increase your risk. There are certain um, ethnic groups that are higher risk, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, most commonly discussed is that black or African-American uh, ethnicity uh, or background um, increases your risk not only of getting glaucoma, but also if you have glaucoma, it increases the risk that you'll get it more severely, a more severe form of glaucoma. Um, and uh, so, so these are important risk factors to talk about. We talked about other uh, um, medical risk factors like migraine or sleep apnea. These are risk factors as well. But all of these risk factors are relatively minor compared to the two major risk factors, which are increasing age. Uh, as you get to be over 50, over 60, over 70, over 80, your uh, risk of glaucoma goes up. It's definitely a disease of aging. And, uh, and your eye pressure. And, uh, and I think it's worth uh, th th talking about that. Increasing eye pressure is an increasing risk factor for glaucoma. But many people with high eye pressures don't go on to develop glaucoma. So just because you have high eye pressure doesn't mean you have glaucoma. In fact, we have a different term for that. We call it ocular hypertension. Hypertension is high pressure. 
Uh, so we call that ocular hypertension, high pressure in the eye. And that doesn't mean that you have glaucoma. It doesn't even mean that the higher pressure needs to be treated. If it's really much higher in the high 20s or 30s, I think both the patient and the provider are going to feel most comfortable starting some, some treatment, even if you don't have glaucoma damage yet, to help prevent that. But a lot of patients have pressures that are over the cutoff that we use for normal, which is 21, uh, and have pressures in the low or mid-20s that, that don't go on to develop glaucoma. Still, those patients need very regular checkups, including all of the testing that we talked about before, just to make sure that they're not converting from ocular hypertension into glaucoma, into frank glaucoma. And then it's also important to remember that half of the people in the world who have glaucoma never had a pressure above 21. And that can happen both in uh, Caucasian populations, it happens more commonly in Asian uh, populations uh, where that kind of what we call normal pressure or normal tension glaucoma is, uh, is much more the norm um, than a high pressure glaucoma. And uh, so uh, it's really, it points to the fact that although that's a critical risk factor, and that is what we treat with our current therapies, the medicines, lasers, and surgeries that we use to treat glaucoma, it's, uh, it's not the full diagnosis. You still need to get that other testing done, even if you have a normal pressure. Somebody with an elevated pressure that's a glaucoma suspect or ocular hypertension, how often do you usually recommend that they are seen in their doctor's office? I would say at least once a year, uh, and including in that once a year, you know, some visual field testing, ideally some uh, uh, imaging of the back of the eye, at a minimum the fundus, uh, the, the picture, the color picture of the back of the eye, we call it a fundus photograph, or the OCT, which uh, as we talked about before, does give you those nice measures uh, uh, of the nerve fiber layer, and we can track those over time. So at least once a year for that full, uh, full set of testing. Um, you know, occasionally in a younger patient in their 30s or, or 40s who has a slightly high pressure but doesn't look that suspicious, otherwise they have a very healthy looking optic nerve, I'll tell them every couple or three years is okay. But certainly as we get into the older population, if you're over 50, um, it, it's just a good idea to check on an annual basis. And I think that that's a very reasonable time frame. Why does the pressure go up higher when we're sleeping? Uh, the why, we're not really sure. A lot of changes in our body happen physiologically when, our sleep, when we're asleep. We have uh, balances of our uh, hormones that change, uh, the stress hormones, including cortisol changes, and that's thought to uh, potentially play a role in that and is being studied. Um, we also know actually just that moving from sitting up to laying down changes the eye pressure. The eye pressure does go up. Uh, acutely just from that. And so um, there's a piece of it that's positioning, uh, but there's a bigger piece of it that has to do with the, the hormones and other things that change uh, between wake and sleep. How about lifting weights? Does that make the pressure go up? And is that dangerous for a, an advanced glaucoma patient? Yeah, that's an important question. And, and, I, and I do tell my more advanced uh, glaucoma patients uh, that I'd really prefer them not to do certain activities. And these are the activities that lead to what we call the Valsalva. That's when you hold your breath or strain against your hold, hold breath. I think many of us can think about if we're lifting something really heavy, we might go and hold our breath. And that actually increases the pressure in our head, including in our eyes. And doing that repetitively uh, uh, for extended periods of time each day does accumulate some extra eye pressure insults. And those are insults that most of us can handle and our optic nerves can handle without any problem. But our most severely affected glaucoma patients, they don't have the, the leftover reserve that we have. And, um, and so for them, I really recommend, you know, switching over to a more cardiovascular type of exercise activity, maybe lower weight, uh, uh, you know, lo lower, uh, you know, less heavy weights, but more repetitions, uh, something that they don't have to do that kind of breath holding. We want them to exercise, uh, but maybe not so much with all that breath holding. And there are other activities. I actually had a patient um, for many years with very advanced glaucoma who um, was a very accomplished saxophone player. 
on that. Similarly, he would practice, you know, for hours a day. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's also in a way like breath holding because you're kind of blowing very hard against resistance uh, to, to, to play your saxophone. And so saxophones and maybe other instruments like that where you might spend a lot of hours a day um, blowing against resistance, that's also an activity that I'll recommend to patients you know, they just, they have to make a decision for themselves at the end of the day. And, and, um, and we don't know how much in any given patient, it will accelerate their move towards damage or blindness. Um, and for some people for whom, um, you know, that might be their, their livelihood, for example, um, they'll, they really have to make a decision about, you know, how to balance, um, uh, you know, their sort of medical issue against their their desire or need to, to play or to work out, things like that. And how about a tight necktie? Yeah, you know, tight neckties, uh, um, you know, have definitely fallen out of favor. And I can tell you as a Californian, it's pretty rare that we find an occasion to wear a tie at all. Uh, but um, uh, but uh, yes, um, you know, anything that constricts blood flow to the head, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, um, you know, root against when it comes to glaucoma. Um, and, uh, you know, probably tight neckties, the way people think of them being tight, it's not tight enough to actually cut off blood flow to your head. Uh, but having some sensitivity to that, I think a more common situation is actually people who are a little bit low blood pressure in the morning, for example, when you just wake up and you swing your feet out of bed and you stand up and you feel for a minute, you feel a little bit lightheaded. And uh, that's actually because you've stood up quickly and all the blood has rushed uh, you know, out of your head before your heart and blood vessels have had a moment to catch up and get the pump, get the pump fully operational. And, uh, and that, that's, a, that's in, you know, a low, low blood flow, low oxygen insult to the optic nerve. And in a glaucoma patient, we definitely want to avoid that. If that's happening regularly for you, we can of course counsel you, you know, sit up in stages when you're waking up in the morning. Uh, you know, spend, even if it's just 10 seconds, you know, sitting up in bed and then swing the legs out 10 more seconds and then stand up, you know, make it a slower process for that first rise in the morning. Keep a, a glass of water by the bedside table and have a little drink before you get out of bed. Uh, that sort of fills up your blood vessel volume uh, within a minute or so. And, uh, and that helps obviously also sustain the blood flow as you're rising. And then for the many patients who might also be on high blood pressure medications, if it's a medication that you take once a day, we actually recommend if you have, you know, advancing glaucoma, we recommend that you take your blood pressure medicine in the morning uh, rather than in the evening if it's one of those one a day medications. Uh, and that way it'll go to work throughout the day when you're up and about anyway, uh, but not um, uh, make your blood pressure drop too low when you're laying down and sleeping at night. Uh, and therefore, then when you wake up in the morning, it might have been a little bit, you know, too low as you're getting up. Let's talk about treatment. We'll talk about the different types of drops. And is there a difference between the different drops? And what are some of your favorites? And is generic as good as branded? Good. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about the drops first. We've got, you know, five or six classes of eye drops right now, of which four or five are the most commonly used. And the most commonly used by far is a class of drops called prostaglandin analogs. There's a generic there's, that's been out for quite a number of years already. It's called latanoprost. And I think for most providers, uh, and also, by the way, for the patient's insurance companies, that's usually the first drop uh, that gets prescribed uh, to a new patient. The uh, 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 prostaglandin analogs, including latanoprost, um, are, are actually very good, very safe drops. Uh, they don't have any systemic side effects throughout the rest of your body. They don't interact with any other medicine that you might be taking. They do have a few local side effects of, at the eye. Uh, one is that they make your eyelashes grow longer and darker. And I always joke that obviously there are some, some patients who are really happy to hear that, uh, other patients who don't care that much. Um, they can make the eyes a little bit red, the white part of your eye a little bit red, not usually itchy or painful, but just a little red. And that's why we usually recommend that patients take the eye drop. It's a one a day drop. We usually recommend that they take it in the evening or right before bed because, you know, if it's a little bit red while you're sleeping, maybe that's not such a big deal. 
but the redness can persist throughout the day. It's not dangerous, but for some patients, that's uh, at, le at least visually irritating uh, or worrisome to them. Um, it can, uh, for people who have very light irises, if you have blue eyes, over time it can make the, your iris uh, a little more pigmented, a little more brown uh, in color. Uh, again, that's just a cosmetic issue. Um, and also over a much longer period of time, it can actually make the uh, fat that's kind of behind the eyelids uh, tighten up or atrophy. And in most patients, that doesn't cause any problem. But in a subset of patients, especially in some of our older patients, it can make kind of like a little divot back on, uh, behind the eyelid that, again, it's, it's purely a cosmetic issue. Um, but, um, and, and that's something that gets noticed on the scale of you know, years or decades, not on the scale of weeks or months. Um, and so, so a very safe, good opening drop. Then we have other drops that have also been around for a long time, uh, uh, beta blockers like timolol and um, carbonic and hydrase inhibitors. And uh, there are two new drops that have just come out. Uh, one is a new, whole new class of drops. They're called ROC inhibitors, Rho kinase inhibitors. Uh, the first entrant in the U.S. market is uh, brand named Ropressa. I should disclose that I have consulted for that company. Um, it's, uh, it's a whole new class of drug, which is obviously an advantage. So you can mix these different drops together if one's not giving you a strong enough effect. And it's not uncommon that we'll have patients on multiple drops, especially as their disease is more advanced. We'll put them on more drops or if their eye pressure is just that much harder to control. Um, and uh, so, so we're, we're lucky to have as many drops as we do. Unfortunately, eye drops just aren't enough for, for a significant fraction of our patients. Um, and for those patients, we have other options. We have lasers and we have surgeries that can lower the eye pressure. Now, there's one kind of laser called selective laser trabeculoplasty, SLT. That gets used not just later in the disease when the drops aren't working, but it's also very effective as a first treatment. And I'll offer newly diagnosed patients the choice and discuss with them the options between starting on an eye drop or getting that laser procedure. That laser procedure is very low risk. It'd be very rare to get any damaging inflammation or anything after that laser. It's been very well studied in large clinical trials and been shown to be very effective at lowering the pressure in mild patients. It doesn't actually burn or char or break anything in the eye. It actually just tickles some of the cells inside the eye to clean the drain. We talked about the fluid draining out. Those cells actually get tickled. They kind of clean up the drain of the outflow of the eye. And when you clean up the drain and more fluid gets out, then the pressure comes down. How long does it typically last, that laser procedure, the SLT? In the patients for whom it lasts, and sometimes you've got to do it a couple of times initially just to kind of get it working uh, in the patient. We'll usually start with like kind of a lower dose of the laser, but then do, a, do, a, do an additional dose of the laser, you know, whether it's um, a couple months later or a year later. Once it lasts, it can last for many years. Um, uh, very often in patients, three to five years. And the nice thing is it can be repeated. So even if you do the laser every three years in a patient, that's fine. It's not, again, you're not burning or scarring or damaging the, the tissues inside the eye. So it can be repeated in that way. And it's been demonstrated to be effective upon repeat and does uh, it in work very as, large clinical trials. And does it work as good as it drops? Does it lower as much or equal? You know, there's a, conception, there's a conception that the laser doesn't do as well as the eye drop. And in some of the early studies, uh, the laser lowered the pressure maybe 20 to 25% on average, whereas latanoprost in, stud, in separate studies can lower the pressure 30, 35% from the baseline pressure. And so that does give a little bit of a vote towards starting with latanoprost. Of course, either of those numbers might be good enough for there are mild glaucoma patients if we're just starting them on therapy. Um, uh, at, but in some of the more recent trials, uh, the LIGHT trial was just published uh, in a series of publications. The laser looks really just as effective um, across the board as the eye drop, and that's reassuring. And, and I think it allows us to have a conversation with our patients because we know that one of the major issues for eye drop effectiveness is that it's very hard for our patients to remember to use the eye drop every day. 
and uh, that we call that compliance with your medicines. And we know compliance is a very big problem. Never mind the issue of being able to use the drop and get it in your eye properly every night, which for some of our older patients, that's that's a challenge in itself. Um, so using the eye drop, I, I like to have a conversation with patients about their preference between, you know, it's on them to remember the eye drop um, uh, versus would they like to do the laser. And, you know, some patients hear laser and even though they're reassured about the low side effect profile or risk profile, uh, they still say, you know what, I'd rather just use the eye drop or they, or they feel like they're taking control of their disease by using the eye drop. Other patients here, oh my God, monthly copay, or I've got to remember to go to the pharmacy every month. I don't want to deal with that. Uh, I just go ahead, I'll take the laser. And so it, it's very much a personal pa patient preference issue. That's why I really like to have a discussion with each patient. No, you and then I was just going to add that late in the disease, um, if the eye drops and or this kind of laser aren't working, we have other lasers and of course surgeries that we can bring the patients to the operating room and, and basically do different things that either help turn off the production of the fluid or more commonly provide an alternative outflow like a, a tube or a shunt that lets some of the fluid out of the eye and therefore the pressure comes down uh, uh, using those techniques. With your experience, how good are those tubes, the MIGs, uh, those new tubes? Yeah, there's, there's a new class of, of uh, glaucoma surgeries. Our, our classic ones, including what's called a trabeculectomy, where we cut kind of a trap door into the white part of the eye to let the fluid out. Uh, by the way, none of the fluid comes out on your cheek. It all gets absorbed back into the body. Um, the trabeculectomy or a, a traditional tube shunt surgery those are our classic surgeries, and, and they still probably between them work the best, but there's been a whole new class of very exciting technologies. They're called MIGs, as you pointed out. They're called minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries. They're less invasive uh, and therefore lower risk to the patients than the trabeculectomy or traditional tube shunt surgeries. Um, they're also less effective uh, in general, where it's been studied head to head or if you make some inferences based on the published studies. Um, but they are so low risk that, that I think their adoption has been very widespread because of that. And, um, and, I, and I use those too, especially, you know, if I can put a patient through a milder surgery first and, and see if we kind of get lucky enough to lower the pressure into a good range of control for that patient, um, I find it worth trying that first uh, before necessarily jumping right to one of our kind of gold standard surgeries. Now, now, in a patient who has very advanced glaucoma, there might not be time to fool around with one of the others, and, and we might decide to jump right to one of the more, more serious surgeries for a more advanced patient or progressing patient. But, um, but that, that, the, the MIGS types of devices have given us a lot of uh, our patients a lot of really good options in recent years. You mentioned some of the new drops and by Zolta where they added a drop to increase nitric oxide. How effective is that and what, what's your experience with that? Yeah, so uh, I had mentioned Ropressa, which is the Rho kinase inhibitor, and Visolta is the other new drop that's come out. Visolta is a chemically modified form of latanoprost uh, where it actually has an extra chemical piece on it that can release a small molecule called nitric oxide. And in the, we actually, we have some hypotheses about how that works to relax the outflow pathways and let more fluid out. Um, in the clinical trials, the uh, Visolta, the latanoprost with the nitric oxide donor um, uh, performed uh, at least as well and in some, and in some of the data even slightly better uh, than latanoprost, the, the generic. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, more work really does need to be done to help characterize whether that's really more effective or as effective. Obviously, a lot of patients have, and, and their um, providers and their insurance companies really prefer them if there's an as effective generic to start with, like plain latanoprost. Uh, rather than jumping right to kind of a full-priced brand name, you know, new drug. Um, and, and more work need, needs to be done on that. I, I know that others are also developing kind of the next generation of nitric oxide donors. It's going to be very exciting to see if we get 
kind of a whole, if Visalta ends up burgeoning into a whole new class of, of drugs that are even more effective than the ones we have now, uh, that's going to be very exciting for sure. Just go back to the rock inhibitors there. Uh, how effective are they? And what are the side effects as far as redness goes of the eye? Yeah, yeah. You know, Visalta has a fairly similar side effect profile with the eye redness to Latanoprost, which is, you know, part of Visalta. Um, but, but the rokinase inhibitors, they're a different class. And, and actually, uh, uh, you know, the, the reddening of the eyes, um, again, not necessarily with itch or, or pain or anything, but just the redness, you know, can be quite severe in some patients, you know, and the surface of their eye can look quite inflamed in that way. Um, so much so that some patients actually do find it intolerable. And in the clinical studies, you know, a small but significant fraction of patients um, you know, certainly found, uh, 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 found the, the side effect profile to be, you know, intolerable. Some patients do, of course, as with any eye drop, happen to react to the eye drop and get kind of itchy or irritated eyes. We actually know that for many of the eye drops, including these new ones, it's actually the preservative in the eye uh, that's commonly used in the uh, preservative in the eye drop that's commonly used um, that, that's actually irritating to the eyes as well. It's not just the active ingredient, but it's actually the preservative found in the bottles. And, and for many of our eye drops, we do have preservative-free options, but we don't yet have that for Ropressa or some of the other newer, newer eye drops. Um, but uh, uh, you can also get some other corneal findings um, you know, that have been much talked about, and your eye care provider might notice that you're getting uh, little deposits or swirls in the edges of your cornea from Ropressa. Uh, those are not uh, found so far to be visually significant, uh, and in most cases will go away if you discontinue the drop. So I usually tell patients if the drop's working for you and it's tolerating it, that I'm not going to stop it just because of some of these incidental findings. Dr. Goldberg, as we wrap up here, can you just talk a little bit about some of your research on stem cells and neuroprotection? and regeneration of the uh, retinal ganglion cells. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, this, is a, this is a hot topic uh, um, and has been for many years because as we've just spent the hour reviewing, it's, uh, you know, we're treating, we're, we're diagnosing and treating, especially treating so much around the eye pressure, but we're doing almost nothing to directly target the retinal ganglion cells in the optic nerve, the parts that are degenerating in the back of the eye. And so what we really want, in addition to our eye pressure lowering approaches to knock out that risk factor, what we really want is something that treats the disease directly uh, in the optic nerve and retina. And, uh, and we call it, uh, we, we have a few different words for it, but we most commonly call it neuroprotection. And that's, you know, a drug or, or device, a therapy that would keep the neurons alive, even if they're, you know, undergoing the insult of glaucoma. And so we're, we're very much on the hunt for neuroprotection, for neuroprotective candidates. Uh, for many years, we and others have been uh, discovering and identifying these candidates for neuroprotection and also for optic nerve regeneration, regrowing the optic nerve uh, in the laboratory. And, and more recently, it's been exciting as we talk about ways to bring that, how do we bring it out of the laboratory into human testing? We have so many patients who are progressing despite having low eye pressures. And, and you know, th these are desperate patients who are losing their vision and, and appropriately want to help accelerate our research and, and be in these clinical trials. So we're now testing a number of these drugs and, uh, and we've started over the last few years at Stanford doing clinical trials uh, for neuroprotection. And uh, uh, we have a, one candidate that's actually implanted inside the eye and makes the drug inside the eye for years. We have another candidate that we just finished a, clinical, a short clinical trial of that's actually delivered as an eye drop. We're actually testing a, um, visual stimulation and seeing whether specific patterns of stimulation can help patients uh, uh, keep their neurons alive in glaucoma. So we've got a lot of really exciting avenues and, we're, and we figured out how to do the clinical trials and, and now we're starting to roll these clinical trials out to, uh, to our patients. And, and it's exciting. At the end of the day, I think it's going to be a belt and suspenders approach. Uh, we're going to have patients one day all on their eye pressure lowering therapies 
And uh, God willing, one or more of these other neuroprotection therapies will work as well, and we'll have patients on those too. How far away are we for something that, that could help somebody? Well, we're in uh, you know, um, a later phase, even phase two randomized clinical trials for some of these therapies. Unfortunately, um, it takes a certain amount of time to do these kinds of trials. Uh, and so, um, you know, and we've got to go through, you know, the FDA, you're familiar with phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, so it, the truth is, is it takes years to get through that gauntlet. On the way to that, we can include, um, you know, some of our most effective affected patients in these clinical trials. And so they get early access by way of being in the clinical trial. Um, I think, um, I think we'll know in the next three to five years whether one or more of these candidates are working and could, you know, there at, at that time point roll out more broadly to patient availability around the country, around the world. Um, and it's really just a question of accelerating those trials. And and uh, thankfully, our biotech and pharmaceutical colleagues, uh, company colleagues, are engaged in. Uh, initiating and running these trials for their best candidates. And we certainly have, um, you know, in the academic world, uh, centers that are uh, very much focused and supportive of getting these trials uh, up and running. So um, we figured out, we figured out as a field how to do the trials, and now it's just a question of getting them going. Dr. Goldberg, is there anything that we missed that you'd like to leave the audience with? You have covered this topic very <laughs> comprehensively. You know, I think I think I would highlight kind of the, you know, uh, two points that we've brought out already. Um, I'd highlight number one: very important to get checked, get yourself checked, even if you're asymptomatic. Make sure that you're getting an eye care check, especially in our in our aging uh, patient population, um, and uh, to make sure that you don't have glaucoma, or if you do, that you're getting followed early and catching it early. So that's kind of like best current practice. And then I want to leave everyone, especially those with advancing glaucoma or bad eye disease, it's an exciting time. And we're gonna see over these next five to 10 years, very exciting advances that come through clinical testing and make it out into our populations of patients. And, um, and so there's just, there's great technology and there's great new medicines and devices coming up the pipeline. And, and I think there's a lot to be hopeful for for the future ahead of us in glaucoma. And Dr. Goldberg, if people want to learn more about you or find out about you, how can they do that? Oh, sure. Well, uh, obviously, uh, uh, Google uh, or your favorite search engine is an easy way to get there. And uh, you can find my web pages, uh, including my laboratory and uh, clinical web pages at ophthalmology.stanford.edu uh, or just by way of Google. If you put my name, Jeffrey Goldberg and Stanford in, you'll certainly uh, find the relevant pages. If you, if you put that in, you'll probably find this podcast and a number of other um, uh, uh, video lectures that might be available to you on the internet from over the past few years talking about some of these same topics. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, anyone who has, uh, you know, access for clinical questions, uh, although I can't see everyone, I have an amazing team of glaucoma doctors, and we do work as a team, and you're certainly welcome to make an appointment to see any of us at the uh, Byers Eye Institute at Stanford. Uh, for both adult or pediatric uh, uh, patients with glaucoma. I want to thank Dr. Jeffrey Goldberg. He's such a wealth of inform information. He's one of the top glaucoma per uh, doctors in the world. So I really thank you for joining me. This is Dr. Kerry Gell for Open Your Eyes and go to openyoureyes2020.com and check out our website. Thank you for joining us. Until next time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.